And we are live. So that was easy. It was just one click. So uh, <laughs> welcome everyone to our first live stream on learning ancient languages or first roundtable discussion. So I am Jonathan Roberts. I'm the director of the Ancient Language Institute. And we have uh, three other guests here with us to uh, talk about ways in which we can learn ancient languages. Uh, what are some methods that you know, different teachers and institutions employ and what we, you know, we will you know, discuss those and then it will be a fairly uh, free flowing conversation. Uh, we'll just get started with some introductions. So I'll just say a little bit about myself and then we'll just go around. So my name is Jonathan Roberts. I'm originally from Aguascalientes, Mexico. So I grew up um, speaking English and Spanish and Spanglish. And I did my undergrad at the King's College. I studied politics, philosophy, and economics. And uh, there is where I got started uh, with Latin. So my junior year, I took uh, Latin two. I, I was too late to take Latin one. So my Christmas break was just studying what, uh, what was studied for, for Latin one. And it was really fun. And knowing Spanish, I got a lot of free, free vocabulary. But then my, my first... Um, venture into teaching ancient languages was while I was a teacher at Great Hearts Academies in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, the Latin teacher had gone off to a, to a law school program, and I really wanted to teach Latin, so I went to the headmaster and said, hey, can I teach Latin? I will, you know, I will beef up. I will take this Latin intensive at the uh, University of Arizona, which, which is where Colin studied. Uh, he'll say more about that. Uh, and I'll be up and I'll, I'll, I'll teach Latin um, if, if you're willing to, to do that. And, and, he, and we made a deal. He said, yes, but you also have to teach Spanish <laughs> uh, because that was their first year launching um, their Spanish program. So high schoolers would go on to either continue with ancient languages and study Greek. And then as the stereotype goes, all the trouble students would go and teach Spanish. And after a year of, of doing that, uh, it, was, it was just a sudden realization. So to give you an idea, my Latin students were using Latin for the new millennium. We had really great support. I had really experienced teachers helping me out. And with Spanish, it was kind of a wild west situation. Nobody had taught Spanish at that school before. I had never seen that textbook that we were using. And it was pretty, it was pretty terrible. It was pretty terrible. And after two weeks, I, I realized if this is so boring for me, if this is destroying my soul, this must be horrible for the students. So we just threw the textbook away and we just read stories, like really easy stories. And since we met once, you know, every day for an hour, we could do a lot. So I would use things in the classroom. It's like, okay, how do I explain what's a book? Oh, well, I just pick up a book and say, ah, esto es un libro, right? Very easy. Esto es una espada, right? And so then I would just talk to my students and explain new vocabulary by means of what was around us. And this was just, you know, based on what I thought would be effective and fun. Uh, and then after a year of, of doing this, I was kind of startling because I, I was talking with one of my students after class in Spanish. I was like, wait, we're just having a conversation in Spanish. And he's telling jokes and he's telling me about how he watches soap operas and TV shows in Spanish. But why can't my Latin students do that? <laughs> What's happening? What, what, how did, how did it come to this? Right. How did it come to this? And, um, and then that was my last year teaching, but that seed, that seed of what well, that just planted a seed in my mind. It's like, how come students can make this much progress in Spanish and not in Latin? They're both languages after all, right? They're both languages after all. So eventually that seed would grow into uh, what is now the Ancient Language Institute. So I'll, I'll pause, uh, I'll stop there and let's hear from, uh, from Colin since, since we mentioned our overlap at the University of Arizona. So, yeah, tell us about yourself, what you're up to, how you got started with languages. And oh, boy. Stuff. How long do you have? <laughs> <laughs> no, um, so my name is Colin Gorey. I'm a linguist in private practice, I guess uh, is the best way to put it. 
Uh, I teach courses online for people who are interested in in learning what makes languages languages tick. And I make videos on YouTube and stream on Twitch, stuff about linguistics, constructed languages, old English, all manner of things. Um, overall, my mission is to bring linguistics out of the ivory tower. That's that's what I say. So I better keep it consistent. That is that's the mission. I did my undergrad and PhD in linguistics. Um, I was at University of Toronto for undergrad and then down to University of Arizona for my PhD. I, I think I needed a change in the scenery and the weather. Um, and I definitely got it in Arizona. Uh, <laughs> but also, that's not the only reason, don't worry, um, that I went to study there. Uh, in Arizona, there's a, a great there's a great tradition of, of theoretical linguistics, but also um, going into things like like language documentation, like um, uh, like experimental linguistics. So we we married together all sorts of worlds in that department, and it was a great place, a great intellectual environment to to sort of develop. Um, but all that to say is, I focused mainly on linguistic theory. Since I graduated, uh, I've become more and more interested in historical linguistics, and in second language acquisition. Uh, which is sort of leads naturally into my current obsession, which is to devise linguistically informed methods of learning and teaching these, learning and teaching languages, especially the ancient ones, especially ones where we don't have any native speakers. Um, there are there's been a lot written on on methods of of link, of language pedagogy, but ancient languages are always in a, a bit of a special case, and we're more hamstrung than normal uh, because we don't have we, a, we don't have native speakers, but B, we often don't have a great variety of pedagogical materials, especially once we get out of uh, Latin and um, to a lesser extent, uh, ancient Greek. We are, we're really limited in terms of the resources, in terms of the readers, in terms of the textbooks, in terms of uh, things like apps, although Biblingo is making a difference in, uh, in, in that regard. And so we have to get creative and we have to really start to look into how best to do it because really we don't have time to waste. So I've been taking all of this approach um, to teaching Old English. That's my my current project. Um, but yeah, I've plabbled on enough. Uh, maybe we could go hear from uh, from Nick since I mentioned Biblingo. Yeah, that's right. Nick, yeah, tell us about, about yourself and Biblingo, what you're up to. Um, yeah. Yeah, thanks. I'm just really glad to be a part of this. So I, I appreciate the invitation. Um, so my name is Nick Mesmer. I am the co-founder of Biblingo, which uh, is primarily a software program for learning Biblical Greek and Hebrew. Uh, we do offer live courses and have a podcast as well, but our primary focus is, is the software program. And really our, our mission as a company is to make uh, the Biblical languages more accessible and easier to learn. And there's really two big pieces to that. One is methodology. So we're trying to take the most up-to-date research in the field of second language acquisition and apply it to ancient languages responsibly. And number two is leveraging technology. Uh, so <clears throat> a lot of people are still using textbooks to learn um, ancient languages, which is much less common when it comes to modern languages. So we want to take some of the best of the technology that's being applied to modern languages and apply it to, to biblical Greek and Hebrew. So a bit... Um, about my personal background, uh, I at this point in time, I consider myself mostly a hobbyist when it comes to languages and language acquisition. Well, and it's part of my job, but uh, I do have some educational background. So um, I started studying Greek and Hebrew in my undergraduate program. So I was I took Attic Greek in a classics department at the University of Georgia and biblical Hebrew in the religion department. Um, and then, and I, I took a bit, good bit, four semesters of Greek and two of Hebrew. Um, and then after that, I went on and did a, a master's in biblical exegesis at Wheaton College, which is basically just um, a program that's focused on studying biblical texts in the original languages. So uh, that's kind of my background, mostly a traditional approach, um, which we'll talk more about what I mean by that. And maybe that's not even the best thing to call it. But um, uh after that, basically, my co-founder for Biblingo, Kevin Grosso, who also has been a very close friend of mine for a long time and happens to be my brother-in-law, um, he started talking to me about how I had learned Greek and Hebrew all wrong and that he's learning a different way to do it. At the time, he was in uh, Jerusalem getting his PhD in Hebrew 
<clears throat> and also doing some of the what people call immersive programs for Greek and Hebrew um, and was just advocating those methods. And when he would come back to visit is when I started to notice that he might be onto something because he didn't just seem to be better at Greek and Hebrew than before, but something fundamentally different seemed to be going on in his head when he was reading these texts. And uh, it kind of came to a climax when he was at my house and he got on the phone for a weekly meeting that he had with a friend of his where they would just speak in biblical Greek and Hebrew. And I had just never seen anything like that before. So I was like, okay, I think you're onto something. And so a little while later is when we, we um, started Biblingo, which he had been planning for quite a long time, but uh, brought me on board. So um, yeah, so again, for the past, I would say two to three years, I've been a bit more of a hobbyist in especially in the um, kind of approaches that we'll, we'll be talking about today. So. Excellent. Great. Yeah. Thank you. And last but not least, we have Carter Ennis all the way from Rome. Uh, yes, tell sir. Us <laughs> about yourself and um, what you're up to and, and all that good stuff. Yeah. So my name is Carter Ennis, currently in Rome for the summer, just traveling. Um, as Jonathan mentioned before we got on, I am fresh off the press of getting an undergraduate degree at New St. Andrews College, um, where I got a degree in liberal arts and culture, which was really awesome because it exposed me to um, Latin, ancient Greek, and biblical Hebrew at this point. Um, but my language journey begins before that. Um, in high school, kind of the beginning of high school, I... Um, well, first of all, I was always kind of interested in the language and how it worked, but I didn't really know anything about how to learn it. And one Christmas, um, my family got the Rosetta Stone for German <laughs> and that kind of started it. So I, but my thinking was everybody who learns languages in high school and I've, you know, you know, have friends who take Spanish in high school or whatever. Um, nobody comes out of high school saying, yes, I can speak Spanish or I can speak German. <laughs> and that always kind of frustrated me. So as a determined high schooler, I was like, I'm going to learn German. I'm really, really going to learn it like from beginning to end. Um, and so that kind of started the journey where I poured myself into hours and hours and hours and it became a hobby of learning German. Um, I got, um, a lot of different materials from all over the internet. I kind of ditched Rosetta Stone pretty early on. Um, but I began looking at stuff by Stephen Krashen, which I'm sure we'll talk about later. <laughs> um, um, and that kind of started um, going down the, the line of just watching videos, listening to podcasts, reading so much stuff, and learning through input. So I was um, taking in so much German. And throughout high school, that led to other language experiences, primarily Spanish and French. Um, to this day, Spanish is probably my best uh, language out of those three, just because I have friends who can speak Spanish, and I've gone to Mexico, and I can speak in Spanish okay at this point. So um, something is working, at least, <laughs> in, in that regard. But by the time I got to college, um, I had the unique opportunity to study with um, Tim Griffith, who's awesome. He's done um, a lot of work with Latin in particular, with Pictodicta, uh, which is a software that we use at Ancient Language Institute, um, teaching Latin through kind of this living method. And that was a super great opportunity. I'm super happy I didn't have to go through the <laughs> grammar translation method of learning Latin. And it was super fun. By the time second year came around, we were doing classes all in Latin, lectures all in Latin. We were talking about the Aeneid, reading it all in Latin, and it was super fun. That was then followed by doing Attic Greek with the amazing Joseph Tipton, um, who's also a great language yeah. guy as well. <laughs> um, oh I'm kind of spoiled here, yeah. Um, so that was super fun. And then just last year, I started doing Hebrew, kind of going into my uh, master's degree. So currently, I am a master's student at NSA as well, doing kind of a cooperative program where I'm doing a theology and letters master's degree with a applied linguistics degree. So that's where I'm at right now. 
Yeah, you keep you keep busy. You, yeah, you're also teaching for us for yes. the International Institute, and yep. you teach a wide range of students. So just tell us <laughs> tell us about that. Yeah, I forgot to mention. So I am a Latin and Ancient Greek fellow at ALI as well, Ancient Language Institute, and I have done uh, a wide range at this point: um, middle school, high school, adults. Um, yeah, so that's kind of what I've been. I've been doing that for about a year, and it yeah, has been yeah. Yeah, so. from from really young to folks who are almost retired or even retired. Um, yep. So great, great. Well, uh, I'll just get us started with some questions, and if you know, folks are watching and uh, feel free to chime in, ask questions, give comments, and we'll try and incorporate them as, as appropriate. So let's just start with a kind of imaginary character that might want to learn an ancient language and decides to go on to Facebook. It right? goes, goes up to Facebook, goes to a goes to, to some Facebook group, and it's like, how, how, be, how can I best learn you know, ancient Greek? Or biblical Hebrew or Latin, and then the, and then there's this this thread war, right? Somebody says something bad about the grammar translation method, and then boom, it all explodes. This this probably happens. I think this happens. I think this is almost a true story. <laughs> and and so when um, when this imaginary character wants to wants to learn a language, he he hears a lot about this grammar translation method natural method direct method and then wants to figure out well what how do i do it now i've heard all these things they're just being thrown at me uh i want to figure out more about what these are um so let's let's start with grammar translation method what is the grammar translation method how does it work what what do students do um what's going on there so any any of you feel free to jump in and we'll we'll just get get started. The grammar translation method, everyone's everyone's favorite thing to hate, right? Um, the grammar translation method is is a kind of an it's an interesting uh, it has an interesting history because it's often called, as Nick alluded to, the traditional method, but it's actually not that traditional. It's uh, Kind of a product, a creature of the 19th century, um, maybe a little bit be, uh, before. Um, the grammar translation method aims to teach a language um, as a type of explicit knowledge. So, with the grammar translation method, there are two halves, as the name sort of suggests. There's a grammar half and the translation half. The grammar half is um, where you're led into trying to understand all of the facts about the language that are relevant. So, these are things like verb charts. Uh, these are things like rules for using different cases. You know, you can get in, in Latin or ancient Greek, you always see this exhaustive list of the different uses of, uses of the cases, the date of reference, this kind of thing. Um, and you learn all these rules and you memorize all these tables. And then the translation aside is there to give you some practice with those, with using those things. So you take those rules, which you've learned, you now know the language, right? So translate some things. And in theory, it sounds great, but in practice, it just doesn't tend to work. And this is mainly the objection to it, <laughs> which I think is a pretty convincing one. It just doesn't seem to produce um, produce people with the kind of knowledge of the language that uh, that they want. And so this is where, in the 20th century, the tides of grammar translation start to recede, and other things start to come into come onto the scene. Yeah, I would I would mention that the grammar translation method is somewhat difficult to talk about because it really was prominent before anything that could be considered like an academic field around second language acquisition really emerged in any significant way. And so since that field that we call second language acquisition has emerged, um, since it, it did emerge, um, the grammar translation method had kind of fallen out of fad for quite a long time. And so no, no really scientific research into the method has been done in, or not as much substantial research has been done on it. So defining it is difficult. Talking about um, any quantitative data on how effective it is, is difficult. Um, there is some of that, but not as much as other methods. So it's difficult to kind of pin down in that way. 
at the same time, I think that says something about it, that since this discipline has emerged where people devote their entire lives and careers to studying how language is learned effectively, um, no one has really given it the, as much of the attention and time as some of these other methods. So I think I think that's significant. But um, yeah, in, in this field of second language acquisition, I think most scholars would say pretty outright that uh, the grammar translation method is, is just not taken very seriously as a holistic approach in the field. So, It's interesting, though, if I can jump in to say that despite the fact that it gets no real attention in the field of second language acquisition, in the practice of second, lang second language acquisition, <laughs> it's all over the place. <laughs> so there's a huge disconnect. And I think this is something that we see over and over again um, in the field of S SLA. I'll just shorten it. Second, mm -hmm. second language acquisition, SLA, um, in the field of SLA, where we have uh, a disconnect between the kind of research that's being done and the kind of application of that research in actual classrooms or yeah. in writing textbooks. Yeah, I have a, a quote that's really relevant to that from um, Richard, Richards and Rogers and Approaches and Methods in Language Teaching. You may have cited them in, in an article you wrote. I don't know if that's where I got it. But they say these texts, referring to textbooks devoted to the grammar translation method, are frequently the products of people trained in literature rather than in language reaching uh, language teaching or applied linguistics. Consequently, though it may be true to say that the grammar translation method is still widely practiced, it has no advocates. It is a method for which there is no theory, there is no literature that offers a rationale or justification for it, or that attempts to relate it to issues in linguistic psychology or educational theory. So just that disconnect between practice and, and theory. Yeah, the, uh, <clears throat> the, the ambiguity that you were mentioning, Nick, kind of reminds me of when the Supreme Court was trying to define pornography. And it's like, I don't know how to define it, but I know it when I see it. <laughs> and same with the uh, grammar translation method. And probably one of the one one way to kind of get get clear in our heads what it what it is, is kind of getting a picture of what it looks like. Uh, so a textbook, right? You pick up a textbook and it's going to do the exact same things that Colin uh, mentioned. It's going to give you a grammar principle. It's going to give you a vocabulary list <clears throat> and then it's going to give you some sentences to translate and um usually they're like really small sentences without any context I, um, and i've always found those sometimes to be really difficult uh, because without context it's like oh man this could mean like seven things um so it 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 seems like it would be easy right but it's like oh no this is actually pretty hard um and and then if you're lucky well we'll see if, if you're if you're lucky there's a passage for you to read right and then there's an additional vocab list that's almost as big as a reading and so students um typically don't get the experience to re of reading successfully in that sort of layout um and that's that's very very common if you look at <clears throat> textbooks such as wheelock um, Latin for the new millennium is probably the bet one of the best better ones in that stream of, of texts. Um, so all that said, I don't know if uh, uh, Carter, you want to add anything about Yeah, I was just thinking too. I mean it's interesting that you guys mentioned this disconnect between kind of the linguistic theory behind the second language acquisition and kind of what's practically happening in the classroom a lot of times. And I think there's, I mean, a lot of times the problem with Latin teaching is that the teachers have no idea how to do the natural method too. Like you have people who, so we have to follow the structure of a class over the semester. And the only way to do that is to follow the textbook, kind of each chapter going through with, you know, and it, and it, it makes it really hard. And I think it, it makes it really hard to, to diverge from that. Um, and I've talked to people who I actually, <laughs> a lot of my, what, a part of the people I teach sometimes are, um, Latin teachers at classical schools. Um, and they're kind of tasked with like, okay, how do I take what you're telling me from Familia Romana or whatever, which is a Latin book, and how do I apply it to a classroom? And so you have to kind of have to like teach that to people too, because people don't know, because they grew up with grammar translation and, or that's what, that's what they were taught. So that would be, I mean, I think it's probably a big reason why there's kind of a disconnect too, 
Yeah, I, I think that's a great point is seeing the disconnect. I think it's important to ask, well, why then are so many people using this method for teaching and learning? Um, and I think there's a handful of reasons we could talk about. I might just mention a few and maybe we circle back to them if we if we decide to move on. But uh, one that I, I've just heard explicitly is um, um, one, one person referred to it as lo lock-in, which is a, a situation where you just continue to do what has been passed on to you or what you're used to or what you have the infrastructure resources to do. Um, in fact, I, as part of my job, I'm on a almost daily basis meeting with uh, university and seminary teachers trying to convince them to use Biblingo in their schools. And uh, an extremely frequent um, response that I get is something along the lines of, well, this seems like a much better way to learn the language, but it just doesn't fit with what we've been doing, or it doesn't fit with kind of the learning outcomes that that our students have to meet, such as parsing and translation and things like that. Um, <clears throat> so, so that idea of lock-in. A couple of things I hear frequently as well, and I think it's important um, to try to be as fair as possible to advocates of, of the grammar translation method and, and why they use it, but um, I think two very big uh, reasons. Uh, number one is they see a difference in the goals that they have for learning an ancient language versus a modern language. So usually the goal is something like reading, um, which we probably should talk more about even what we mean by reading. Um, and the other big thing is is they see it as impractical to do, do something more like you do with modern languages. Um, with, to do that with ancient languages because we don't have native speakers or things like that. Um, and so in a lot of ways, people use the grammar translation method because they feel like that's all they have. Um, so beyond that, there, there, there certainly are people who probably think it is a, a, an effective method and that's why they use it. But I think there are some other reasons as well. Yeah, There's I'll another. Oh, sorry. Oh, well, I was just to say that that what Nick, what you were describing, is also called in economics path dependency. It's just like the the path has been laid, and you just it's just so hard. And with like, is it called Betamax? It was the pre VHS video device. I don't think I've ever seen it. Uh, I've only heard of it as an example. In I've seen it. <laughs> um, Betamax. So Betamax was actually superior to VHS in different ways. But the, the path dependency in this case is kind of the opposite. We have this idea of progress, right? So the next thing is obviously going to be better. And so VHS kind of replaced Betamax. But here is kind of the opposite. It's like the grammar translation method. We're on the grammar translation train. And um, Nick here has to deal with like a hostage situation and, and go in and, and uh, redirect the path. Um, so, uh, Colin, yeah, you were going to say? There's another kind of reason or motivation for using the grammar translation method that comes from uh, from the discussions in the 19th century, which is that it builds character. Doing this kind of, um, this kind of analytical work, it requires discipline. You have to sit down, do the translation. It, it's supposed to build character. And honestly, I think it does. <laughs> <laughs> I think it does. But if, you know... We have to be honest about what our goals are when we're when we're teaching a language. Are we primarily trying to teach character? I mean, you could get someone to go out and build a wall, um, you know, right. to, to accomplish the same goal. I would rather uh, grow within them a knowledge of the language that would then allow them to do whatever they want with it. Yeah. So one uh, one question about the grammar translation method: Can it work? Is it possible? Is it possible for it even to work? Sure. I yeah, I was gonna say, yeah, I've <laughs> I've seen and I've talked to people who are I mean it I think you know obviously everybody's different. So people some people like grammar <laughs> and they enjoy it. And I have seen people who are incredibly good at Latin, Greek, and Hebrew and whatever, who have done it through the grammar translation method and you know they're far better than I'm ever gonna be. But those people are usually in the minority. So that's what I would say. Yeah, yeah, I would say, <clears throat> um, number one, again, it depends on, it may depend on your goals. So I mentioned maybe your goal is reading, but then you might need to nuance that more. Is it 
is it reading fluently like you read in your native language and what all does that involve but a lot of people studying ancient languages especially the biblical languages are interested in something like grammatical analysis um, so that you know if that's your goal then perhaps the grammar translation method could be successful um, other other things you have to think about though are that that methods are not these kind of they don't have hard barriers and they're not always mutually exclusive. So perhaps some people who are yeah. successful using the grammar translation method have accidentally used things that really belong to another method or something like <laughs> that. Uh, but then ad additionally, you know, there is a sense in which some people, I think a minority of people are geared to think in a way that the grammar translation method kind of suits a very analytical almost mathematical kind of mind. Um, but again, I, I think the key thing is, is what are your goals? And of course, a more important question than can it be successful is, is it the most effective and efficient way? Right. But so yeah. all that to say that I would answer hesitantly, yes, it, it can work. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. A, a lot of nuance. It's possible. Um, yeah. And, 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 uh, I think that's a good point. You can, we can imagine someone, and this is probably this, this is probably how it happens, that has tons and tons of time and can just translate and translate and translate and just consume so much content in the target language that they get to be really good. Um, a lot of folks don't have that sort of time, right? Or that sort of stamina. For most folks, it's just they're just going to be bored to death. They're not going to get very far. Um, but so, yeah, I agree. It is possible. Um, now, before we yeah, if I can just say yeah, one more thing on that, um, because the method is sometimes hard to pin down and define it, I do often find it's helpful to use analogies. So one I like to use is the analogy of music. Um, so you can learn music in two ways. One, you can like learn to play an instrument. And number two, you can learn music theory. So the grammar translation method and the analogy um, kind of corresponds more so to learning music theory, whereas there's another way of learning a language that is more similar to learning to play an instrument. But I think the important thing is maybe your goal is being a music theorist, again, in which case studying music theory is probably effective. But um, the question is, you know, is it possible for someone to become a mm -hmm. skilled musician by only studying yeah. music theory? Like maybe, right? I don't know. But it, it just seems far-fetched. Um, but that doesn't mean the two are entirely exclusive of, of one another. Perhaps learning some music theory could be beneficial to playing an instrument. But again, we'll dive into that a lot more. Right. Yeah. And before we jump into other methods, <clears throat> it just occurred to me that, or was reminded of, um, one of the reasons why people like the grammar translation method, some folks, even students, um, especially at the beginning stage, is that I think it gives them a sense of security, all right? Because you can see a text in this alien language, all these Greek characters, and then <clears throat> if you can translate it into, into English, you feel a sense of mastery. It's like, oh, I did it. I know it. Uh, and, it, it and it feels objective, right? It feels like you really, you really figured out what it means. And <clears throat> now that it's in English, things are certain gives you this feeling of certainty. So there's that kind of psychological pull as well, I think. Okay, so what what else is there? What, el what else is there? Um, tell us, well, are there any other options? Or are we stuck? <laughs> We're not stuck. All right. We're not well, stuck. We have some other options. Show us the way. So there are lots of methods with names and acronyms and things like that. Um, the alternative you can generally think of in terms of a, a universe of, of types of approaches that come back to a particular idea about what is going on with second language acquisition. What is going, what exactly is occurring? Um, and what exactly a language is. So if we take the point of view, this is a, a point of view that comes out of sort of the tradition of cognitive science, that that a language, certain aspects of a language anyway, are a type of knowledge, a type of unconscious knowledge that we have that allows us to, to produce and comprehend the language. Uh, it's the sort of foundation that allows 
me to string together these words and have them fit into this set of um, this, this set of sentences that are called English sentences, and for all of you to understand what they mean. Um, it's because I have some kind of knowledge that is allowing me to do this. Uh, and acquisition is the acquisition of this knowledge. Uh, so if we look at language as uh, a type of knowledge, we have to consider how do you acquire, how do you get that knowledge into your head? How do you go from state A without it to state B with it, to simplify pretty drastically? Um, and it seems to be with language that the way that it comes in, the way it's acquired is by, um, is by processing what's called input. This is language that, um, that you encounter in, in your environment um, that, is, that is communicating something to you. Um, when we process this input, what are we doing? We're making connections between form and meaning. So linguistic forms come at you, whether this is um, in sound, whether this is gesture, whether this is um, marks on a page, pixels on a screen, some forms are coming at you. And if you are able to make the connection between the forms and the meaning that these forms correspond to within the language, um, so, you know, mug, m, a, g, right? Refers to this, by the way, check it out. Um, if you're able to make those correspondences, something goes on and it's still somewhat mysterious exactly what is going on on the, you know, on the, on the uh, level of the brain, but in, on the level of the mind, if we think of it that way, um, you are building up a system of representations, of mental representations of the rules of the language. And the rules of the language as they're represented in your mind are very abstract things. They are not the rules that you learn in a grammar translation style textbook. There's no, there's nothing in here that says dative of reference or, um, you know, in a sentence, you in a question, you have to uh, flip the verb with the set. You know, the, none of this stuff exists. There, these rules exist on a really abstract level. The way reason we know that is because the there are phenomena in language that are just bizarre and can't can't be explained except by reference to these sort of super abstract rules. Um, so you can say things like, um, "I drank coffee and tea." What did you drink? Coffee and tea. Um, but you can't say, what did you drink coffee and? Why not, right? That seems like it should make sense. It's perfectly comprehensible what you're getting at. But it seems like it just isn't part of English. And linguists go, you know, and spend careers figuring out these super abstract rules. But but we don't, right? Well, I do because I'm a linguist. But, <laughs> but, um, but people who are acquiring lingu uh, uh, English don't need to do this. Something's doing it for them up here. And it's doing it for them just by processing this, these four meaning connections in the input. So the cloud of approaches that I like to call input-based, because they acknowledge this role of the input, um, that form an alternative to the grammar translation method, however we want to define it, um, they come out of that tradition. So they have lots of names. Maybe some of you know some of them. Uh, or have ones that you prefer. I like input-based. They're just very ecumenical. You do you you have the large tent and you exactly take it, take it from there. <laughs> very good, Nick or Carter. Any uh, thoughts on alternative methods? Uh, any names? Maybe you can give us some names. Yeah, I think. Um... Yeah, I think there's there's a handful of ways to even approach the question. One could be historically looking at different theories or approaches that were given names that kind of popped up uh, throughout hi history. Um, <clears throat> so this is where we might talk about things like um, one, the grammar translation method, but then the audio lingual method, the direct method, um, the natural approach. So these are all all um, labels that refer to um, pretty established approaches uh, where there were certain scholars who were you know key in coming up with them and things like that. Um, but I, I agree with Colin that there 
there may be a more helpful way of approaching it is looking at kind of what is the common denominator with a lot of these, um, not necessarily all the ones I, I named, but especially a lot of the newer ones. Um, and I think that, uh, so Colin kind of touched on what you might call implicit knowledge um, <clears throat> is, is key to it. So that would stand in contrast to what you might call explicit knowledge. Um, and explicit knowledge really um, is knowledge of the language that requires meta language, meaning you have a set of language that you use to refer to the language and how it works. So even, you know, something as simple as the, the label noun is or verb or adjective, that's meta language that we use to describe language. So that would refer to explicit knowledge, um, whereas implicit knowledge, you don't need any of that to know about the language. So most native speakers of most languages um, maybe have some meta language, but don't have all the meta language. So I do think that um, this kind of alternative to the grammar translation method, where the grammar translation method is highly focused on the, on the meta language, the explicit knowledge, this other option or set of options is very focused on implicit knowledge. That being said, I, I even there would distinguish between method and goal. So I think mm -hmm. the goal of most modern second language acquisition approaches is primarily implicit knowledge of the language. That doesn't necessarily mean that doing explicit learning of, of these things might not contribute to the, the acquisition of implicit knowledge. So there's kind of a fine distinction there. So your method might include Maybe it it won't. Maybe we'll get more into that. But right. I do th I, I do think this set of approaches is more focused on implicit knowledge versus explicit knowledge. Um, personally, I prefer to use uh, maybe the label communicative approaches um, rather than input based. Or I can't remember exactly what you said around input, Colin. But the reason I don't like to use something like input is because I think the input thing the label is very associated with Krashen's work. Um, and I think that, so Stephen Krashen was a second language acquisition scholar is, and but a lot of his theories came about in, I want to say the seventies or eighties. Um, mm -hmm. And one of his things was called in, um, comprehensible input or input um, hypothesis. And while very, very kind of almost groundbreaking in the field. And still so much of the field owes um, a lot to Krashen's work. I think in a lot of ways, the field has has moved on from some of his more strong claims about input. Um, that being said, I still think input is is central to these approaches. But I, I try to not make the association with Krashen because of some of the specific claims about input that he made. So I prefer communicative. Um, there are drawbacks to that, but I think it's broad enough and gets to the heart of the goal, which is being able to use language in, in um, acts of communication, which r could be done through four different skills, reading, writing, speaking, and listening. So that's kind of my take. Great, and I think um, some folks, you know, if if you're if you've made it this far, you've probably heard of Krashen before. Um, so Nick, I think it might be interesting um, for our listeners and viewers to hear more about uh, different. You know, what what were the claims that Krashen was making, and and what ways has the field moved um, beyond them or refined them? You know, uh, yeah. So on and forth. Yeah, I, I wonder if someone could maybe talk a little bit about Krashen while I figure out why my laptop is not charging because um, it's about to die. So I maybe need like one or two minutes, but I, maybe someone else could start with Krashen. Yeah, it would be great. Uh, Colin or Carter, Carter, since you mentioned. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so I I consider myself more of a follower of Krashen than Nick does probably, but <laughs> um, um I think, as Nick was already talking about, one of the biggest things that is emphasized, I would say, uh, at least just in personal research, is um, comprehensible input. So, right, you're not necessarily thrown into the deep end without being able to understand a word of Latin. So, for instance, you wouldn't start learning Latin with Cicero or whatever. Um, you would kind of begin at 
a level that you can understand at least, you know, maybe half of it or more, right? And you continually keep getting more and more of that, um, which just in personal experience, I have found is um, very helpful because, um, I mean, it, it, it gets you in to reading and listening um, and it gets a lot of input in, but um, your progression seems more um, attainable in some ways. So for instance, let me explain. So for instance, when I'm learning um, Spanish or something like that, and this can even apply to Latin. Um, there's nothing like Spanish. I, <laughs> there's nothing like Spanish. Go ahead. <laughs> um, with learning something like Spanish, I'll, I'll kind of start off my journey, let's say, <laughs> if I'm going to start learning Spanish with, um, this is what I've done in the past, is kind of, I'll take some video, some interview, something like that, and I'll listen to it. I'll have a word of what's being said. Okay. So let's say my goal is to try to get there. I go back and I'm like, okay, so let's start with something really easy. And over the months of studying or years even, it has been super encouraging because as I go through the, you know, steady progress of getting more and more input, that's a little bit harder each time. I'll keep, you know, jumping back to that original video. I'm like, okay, Ooh, I can understand about 50%. <laughs> oh no, I can understand about 70. And so by the end, I'm like, okay, I can understand basically everything here. Um, that's super encouraging for me um, just to kind of like start with really easy stuff, get to the harder stuff um, and kind of have a goal in your mind. Um, so that's kind of one of his biggest things is starting with um, stuff that's, you know, stuff that you can understand, even if it's not fully, but at least partially. And I think another thing, if I'm not mistaken, too, you guys can comment on this, obviously, is, is novelty. So the idea that you have to um, introduce new, new content, basically, um, which I think solves the problem of getting bored really easily because <laughs> um, you want to kind of keep it fresh and you want to be looking at new stuff so you're not just like okay oof, here we go again um and so that can be really helpful too and it helps motivate you to you know keep keep um keep learning the language getting more input and stuff like that so i don't know i that's kind of just like from what i've seen kind of two of his biggest things i don't know if you guys want to specify those anymore I'm by no means an expert, so. <laughs> yeah, no, th thanks for jumping in there. I figured figured out the problem um, <clears throat> with my charging, so I'm good. Um, yeah, I'll say a little bit about Krashen. Uh, number one, again, I, I really want to emphasize how important he is in the field and, and his contribution. So um, Carter brought up the idea of comprehensible input, which I think is still very fundamental. It, it's really the basis of a lot of what we do in Biblingo. And, and like Carter said, it's the idea of um, the best way to acquire really like new things in the language, whether vocabulary or grammar, grammatical constructions is through um, input, which means reading or listening, um, specifically input that's comprehensible um, so you can understand it. Um, defining comprehensible can be difficult. Um, Krashen used a formula called I plus one where I is what you already know of the language and one is again, some like, not very specifically defined new thing of the language. So it doesn't necessarily have to be only one new word, but it's just one small piece. So that being said, the input should be mostly known to you. And his theory is that that's the most effective way to acquire new pieces of the language. That wholeheartedly agree with. Um, some of the things that I think um, the field has critiqued him more heavily on is so number one is the role of input. So he not only said that input is necessary, but that it's sufficient for acquiring a language. Um, and while some scholar, SLA scholars, I think would agree, I think many wouldn't agree with specifically the sufficient part. I think most would probably agree that it's necessary, um, but many would disagree that it's sufficient. But even bigger than that is um, he, he would say that this input approach, um, or in, sorry, not this approach, but 
getting input in the language is not only necessary and sufficient, but the most effective way. Um, and again, I'm, that's where I think the field has really um, would really depart is that um, a lot of scholars and approaches would say that while input is necessary and really important, um, output is also very effective and important. So Krashen um, had what is often called the silent period, where he said that learners of a language from the start should not try to produce any output in the language. They shouldn't speak or write at all for this initial period. Again, it wasn't said. I think it usually, I think he said around when you acquire 500 words is where you might be start producing. Uh, it would, I think he said usually six months or something like that. But the idea is that output, the ability to produce output would kind of naturally arise from getting a lot of input. So while again, maybe it would naturally arise in that way, I would question if if um, perhaps a more effective and efficient way would be to introduce output earlier on in the process. Um, there are some other things. Uh, another big hypothesis of his was the monitor theory or hypothesis um, that kind of talked about the role of explicit grammar. Um, and he basically um, reduced the role of explicit grammar or explicit knowledge of the language to um, kind of checking you, that your output is correct. So when you were about to say something, you would kind of use some rules that you know to like make sure you're being accurate. Um, again, I would question, not only would I question, but I think the field questions if that's the only role of explicit um, grammar. And the last thing that's pretty fundamental to his approach is um, a lot of his theories were based on an assumption that L2 learning or learning a second language is very, very, very similar to L1 or learning your your first language. So his approach, kind of all these sets of hypotheses he's had are, are often referred to as the natural approach. And so kind of at the, at the core of it is that learning a second language most effective, to do it most effectively is to do it like you learned your first language naturally. Um, and I think, again, while there's a lot to that, I think the field acknowledges a bigger difference between the two um, and that undercuts some of his hypotheses. One thing that's interesting about the field of second language acquisition and basically <laughs> applied linguistics and all of linguistics is that um, it very rarely speaks with one voice on these matters. And one of the things that it does more or less say with one voice in the SLA world is of, about the importance of input, about the, as Nick said, this is something that's necessary. Um, it's, I think, essentially all or almost all mainstream uh, theories of second language acquisition acknowledge the uh, central role of input. Where they differ is, <laughs> is it enough? Uh, is Do you need anything but input? So th this Nick alluded to as well, or is actually more than alluded to, said, said explicitly. There's also talk about what happens. So we have explicit knowledge, we have implicit knowledge, what's the relationship? This is uh, what Nick was in, uh, introducing about the monitor hypothesis. There's still debate as to what the relationship between explicit knowledge and implicit knowledge is, can explicit knowledge cross over into implicit knowledge? Mm, not sure. Um, the field the field argues about this. Um, there are other things like explicit teaching. Is explicit teaching, can it give you implicit knowledge? So explicit versus implicit teaching and learning. Um, the, 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 there's, uh, when we're talking about terminology, uh, Communicative approach, I think, is a really, really good one. The danger I've found with it is that sometimes people take it to mean we are teaching you to communicate. And so you get things like phrase lists, like here are the seven things you have to say at a restaurant. Here are the seven things you have to say at the post office. Um, whereas communicative is really about um, the context in which we, uh, we are exposed to input. It seems, for whatever reason, that we need to be in this communicative, communicative context to be processing the input in the way that leads to the acquisition of this implicit knowledge. So out of context things, and here we're going back to the, uh, the grammar translation you know, punching bag, but out of context phrases that we're translating don't seem to trigger this because they're not communicating anything to us. They're just example sentences or sampled dialogues, or you know, the phrase book of things to go um, say at the post office. You're not at the post office. <laughs> you're in a classroom, or you're sitting at your desk with, um, with a book. When you're 
sitting at your desk with a book, that's your context. And you're reading the book, that's communicating to you. You're reading about the, the something that's happening in the book. There's some there's something that's trying to that you're trying to get. And it's in these contexts that the work of acquisition seems to to happen. And so I think that's the strength of the the term communicative as just as long as it's kept in mind that it's not a, necessarily about that you know let's pretend we're at the post office all the time. Um, yeah, so communicative and input based, I think those are those are two two terms that 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 work really well together. Maybe we could just say communicative input based. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Nick, uh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Nick. Yeah, no, I, I think that's really helpful, and I certainly think there are drawbacks to to the term. Uh, other uh, other. So to to that um, idea you talked about context. So you could even zoom in within the communicative approach, and there are very specific approaches, like you said, that actually would hold that. Um, to learn the language most effectively, you need to do so in these contexts that at least simulate real world, world scenarios. So I think one is called like task-based language learning. So you're learning the language in the context of performing tasks. Someone tells you to do something in the language and you do it. To try to make it more authentic is really the um, word that's used a lot. Um, and so, yeah, I, I actually don't think that kind of authenticity of the situation is as important as it's often made out to be. And so, therefore, I don't think it's essential to what I call a communicative approach. I think the what I see as core to the communicative approach is um, is the, the focus on meaning rather than the focus on um, the form of the language, how that meaning is. It's more focused on the meaning than how the meaning is, is occurring. Um, but that even has to be nuanced because People, for example, who use the grammar translation method would say, of course, I care mostly about the meaning. That's what I'm trying to get at. But um, the point is that to be focused on the meaning at any given point in time that you're processing the language, there are certain minimum thresholds that have to be there. One, for example, is the threshold of how much of the language you know or of, of the text you know if we're talking about reading. So that's where comprehensible input comes in. But the point is that if you if you don't know enough of what's there, you can't be focused on the message. You, you must be focused on the form. Um, so there are ideas brought in from like cognitive psychology that say that we only have so much cognitive capacity to use when we're processing language and if you're you if you have to use too much of that processing power to think about the form of the language or the words that you don't know you 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 must take your focus off the meaning so um, another minimum threshold is speed so the speed at which you can process so if we're talking about reading if you can't read fast enough or if you can't process the text fast enough you can't be focused on the meaning um, so that's what i mean by meaning focused not necessarily that your goal is to understand the meaning, but that at any given point, when you're engaging the language, you are focused on the meaning. Um, that's what I mean by meaning focused. And I would say being meaning focused is really the essence of any sort of communicative approach. Yeah. Another uh, kind of image that is close to what you were talking about, Nick, is <clears throat> like beginning students, sometimes they can find it hard to both read out loud and understand um because again they're initially right when they're reading out loud they might just be focusing on how does this sound <laughs> and trying to trying to focus on that and on meaning at the same time can sometimes be a bit much um so yeah that's i think that, that sounds that sounds right yeah yeah sorry I, um maybe i should not say so much but that, that's a really good point and and actually um so when i'm talking about that being meaning focused um the concept of fluency is really important is you you have to have a, a certain measure of fluency with the language to be able to be meaning focused so those thresholds i talked about relate to fluency but um some really interesting research in the field um actually mostly in the cognitive kind of psychology part of the field is on how fluency with the with um the kind of more fundamental processes involved in in processing language are um, necessary for developing more like macro fluency. So fluency in phonics, which means associating like letters with sound, is necessary for being fluent at reading. So as you said, if if you can't look at the letters and automatically 
know or process the sound associated with it. If you're not fluent at that, then you're not going to be able to be fluent at reading because you're going to be using too much of your cognitive power to just make that that letter sound connection. So that's exactly yeah what I'm talking about. Yeah. There's a an interesting difference in um, that's been brought out in some of the literature about talking about the the knowledge of language, which is the mental representation, um, which is acquired by input. But then there is the real time use of that knowledge, translating that into sentences, making that available to to comprehend what you hear. Um, these are things which don't seem to work in the same way as the building up of that implicit knowledge. These to seem to be things that are more like skills. Uh, and so they they develop in ways that are more that that skills develop. So by things like practice. And so this is where it can get a bit a bit tangled because you can say, well, in the strict input, like if, if you're Stephen Krashen, for example, uh, and you're thinking about a very strong version of the input hypothesis, in, input is uh, necessary and sufficient, what use is practice? I, I'm not attributing this to, to Stephen Krashen, but if you took a really literal view of that, um, of, 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 of that hypothesis, what use is practice? This, there's no point. All you need is input, right? But it seems to be that we actually do get faster at reading when we practice, when we read more. So what's going on there? Well, there are all sorts of different skills that are um, kind of orbiting around this central, uh, this central knowledge of language that have to do with, with applying that knowledge. And these seem to get faster when we practice them. And these can be quite specific. So if we think of um, in, our, in our first languages, there are all sorts of skills that we had to learn. There are skills involving reading. That's probably the, the most obvious one. That doesn't come at the same time as the rest, as the other aspects of language. When we talk about second language acquisition, we're talking about reading, writing, uh, listening, speaking. First language acquisition, we get two of those a lot faster than the other two, right? And sometimes we don't get the other two. They're not even necessarily, they don't come with the language. That literacy is something else. And so those skills improve with practice, it seems. The skill of writing an essay, that's a very specific type of writing. That improves with practice. That's not something we're born with. When we learn to write, we don't know how to write essays. When we learn to speak, we don't know how to. We don't learn how to speak on the phone. So are the, there are these more specific skills which we can also develop, and it ends up getting, you know, it ends up getting quite uh, quite time consuming for the uh, for the language learner. Um, but crucially, to bring out the the relationship between these two things, you cannot practice what you don't have. So if you're talking about um, improving your your speed of access of your knowledge of language. You have to have the knowledge of language there in the, in the first place. You can't practice your way around that. Um, fortunately, the, the things that you do to practice, reading, talking to people, listening, um, also are great sources of input. So there, this is in some ways uh, why the questions get so, um, so thorny because anyone can point to a technique, uh, a method and say, well, I'd use this and I got to a high level. So that means your technique is wrong. But a lot of these methods and techniques share crucial ingredients that that make them work. It's just a question of, you know, which one is faster uh, and which one's more efficient. And I think that there are strong indications that uh, what we've been calling input-based or, or communicative methods are the kinds that that you should at least start with. Yeah, that's a, that's a great, great point. And to kind of go back to our imaginary, you know, Facebook character, trying to figure out what to do. So so far, our imaginary Facebook character is like, okay, I need a, I need to get exposed to as much content that I can understand, and the target language as possible. That makes sense. I'm sold. But somebody, somebody mentioned something about speaking the language. Say that I'm interested in ancient Greek or ancient Latin or ancient Hebrew speaking the language why why would i do that i'm not gonna order a cappuccino and coin a greek right uh and if i go to the vatican i'm probably not gonna use the adm there right in latin <laughs> why um so so now there's this question why speak what good does it do especially if and let's let's make that question a little bit more precise say that a reader or reader or you know faithful facebook user here 
<clears throat> is has this goal of reading. I want to be able to read texts. I don't really, I don't really care about speaking. I just want to read. So why should I speak it? Uh, what what um, what do you all say to this uh, to this question? Um, I think the first, yeah, the first thing I would say is distinguishing between speaking as a method and speaking as a goal. Um, so just because it's not your goal doesn't mean it isn't a good method for achieving your goal. So the question there would be, does speaking the language help you become a better reader of the language? So that's just a, a question first. But the other distinction I think is, that's important is um, the distinction between like speaking um, or, or the content of what you're speaking and what's happening in your head as you're speaking or the way that speaking allows you to engage uniquely with the language. So what I mean by that is um, just because you want to speak the language doesn't mean you need to learn how to or order a cappuccino in the language, right? Um, so <clears throat> my, my point is that adopting speaking as a method does not um, commit you to any content of the language that you're going to be speaking. It doesn't commit you to learning how to ask where to go to the bathroom or anything like that. All it does is commit you to um, whatever con kind of content from the language you want to learn, you're committing to speaking that content as a way to learn it. So that that's where I would start is just making some distinctions about what we mean by speaking the language. Um, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. that's a really good point. And just to kind of highlight that I think it, it's good to make that distinction. And I, I like to say it's a distinction between conversational and spoken because conversational often is that sort of thing. Like, where is the taqueria? Donde esta la taqueria? Right. Where, where can I get the tacos? How can I order the beer? Um, how can I assassinate Julius Caesar? You know, things like that, um, that you would use in daily life, but spoken, um, I, I see it more as a sort of literary approach as you're, you're talking about a text or you're talking about an image. Um, and it's not, it's not that same sort of exercise as conversational. Um, so I think that that's, that's a helpful, um, helpful distinction. Any uh, further thoughts on why speak? What, what will you tell this, this person if you're, you know, you're stuck in the elevator with him? Um, just from, I mean, again, speaking from personal experience, um, the, the thing that I've found, and especially when teaching and even when teaching kids, especially is speaking really kind of fossilizes the language, if you will, <laughs> in kind of a way that I think just reading it won't. Um, so when you have, you know, you ask kids, for example, if you're in a Latin class, quidest uh, in hockey monkey name or whatever. What's in this picture? And they're able to say est vir or something. Um, and having them be able to kind of repeat back things and answer questions really gets the kind of the bones of the grammar even. And again, it's more an implicit knowledge that starts to happen over time. The more they speak it and the more they um, get more input. Um, and it just helps them kind of have it in their brain. And so even for adults, and I found this when I, you know, with myself too, is it's um, the second I start to use the language, um, and even when it's an ancient language like Latin or something, um, it becomes real in a way that just reading it wouldn't. Um, you start to kind of get a good sense of how, how words are, you know, put together to make senses. Um, and again, even if it's, it's not formal knowledge, I don't know why, for instance, let's say you have a student who has no idea why the dative is used here or whatever, um, but that's just how you say it. Like, okay, for example, um, nomen est mihi. Why in the world do you use the dative there? Um, instead of having to explain it, which you could do, um, they just know that's exactly how you say it. And the more they speak, I think that that kind of gets that into their brain. So that's what I would say, just from a teaching perspective, it's it's really helpful for the students. Whatever um, point of view you have on the value of output in language acquisition, 
I think that there's not a good argument against doing it. Um, whether you believe the output is directly uh, helpful in acquisition, great. If so, wonderful, then output. If you don't, if you are a very strong sort of input only type of person, well, when you output, you obtain more input in, in a communicative context, in the, in the canonical communicative context, which is a conversation. Um, so wonderful. You are now in a conversation with, inter with an interlocutor who can modulate the, uh, the difficulty of the, um, of the spoken text, right? Of, the, of what input you're receiving to something you can comprehend. You can do things like, you know, look confused. Uh, what, what did you mean by that? And then they can recast and you can use all sorts of techniques like that. And you hone in on the level and you're delivering like the exact kind of input that even the most hardcore input only person would say, that's the good stuff. So I think that's uh, a lot of good reasons to to speak. Yeah. I would say too. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, you go for it. Go for it, Carter. I, I was just going to say, um, speaking is also really fun. <laughs> you know, it, it makes learning Latin not horrible, right? And then there's a lot of things that do that. But speaking, and for all ages, I have found is it makes it way more enjoyable. And that's kind of going, getting back into the motivation behind the, the student, right? Like if they want to learn it and they want to come to class and they want to jump in and start speaking, um, then it makes it just more fun for me as the teacher and the students as well. Like I remember having a student, um, actually a, a guy who was, um, who had to teach for a classical school. And we got to the point where we were just talking in Latin the whole time in class. And it was super fun and we both enjoyed it. So that's that's another thing too that I would say about speaking. Yeah, and I think that shouldn't be downplayed. I mean, motivation, even in the research, like motivation is so critical for learning and maintaining your language skills. Um, and it kind of almost goes back to what you said early on, Jonathan, about translating a text into your native language gives you this sense of control over it and mastery and like accomplishment. Mm -hmm. I, I think producing the language yeah. does that all the more. Um, but yeah, in terms of the, the benefit of speaking from the research side, um, in, in the field of second language acquisition, um, uh, starting early on, um, I think in the nineties is when, people began pushing back actually against Krashen's input stuff. And so Krashen had the input hypothesis. And then in the 90s, Swain came up with the output hypothesis, um, which just emphasized the the importance of output. Um, after that came the interaction hypothesis, which talks about both. Um, anyway, but the well, output that, hypothesis... Well, that's just Hegelian synthesis right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but the output hypothesis, Swain talks about three important aspects of output. And I'm, I'll just say them quickly. The one is the noticing function, which refers to when you produce the language, you notice what you don't know about the language. So when you're trying to say something, you you notice that you know how to say it in some ways and not others and things like that. Um, the second is hypothesis testing function, which is, um, I'll just read what I have. When a learner says something, there's always an at least tacit hypothesis underlying his or her utterance. Um, for example, about grammar. So by uttering something, the learner tests this hypothesis and re receives feedback from the interlocutor. So that's especially in the context of conversation. You can get feedback and test hypotheses about the language. And again, kind of learn what you do and don't know, which is extremely helpful. The third is a metalinguistic function, which means that learners reflect on the language they learn and thereby the output enables them to control and internalize linguistic knowledge. So that's the output hypothesis, kind of earlier stages of talking about the role of output. Since then, I, I just think it's become pretty ubiquitous in the field that output is at least helpful. Um, I, uh, people do emphasize in the field the limits of it and, and really emphasize more the ben benefits of input. But I think it's pretty ubiquitous that people acknowledge that it's helpful, uh, primarily in that um, it, it causes you to process the language more deeply. So... Um, Besides the theory, just empirically, there have been studies that show that people who practice um, active skills like speaking and writing become better at passive skills like reading and listening than if they only practice passive skills. So that's just like empirical data. 
on it. Um, and of course, that can be challenged and, and all of that. But there are studies that kind of demonstrate that. I think almost more compelling research is coming from, um, again, the field of cognitive psychology. So there's actually someone I'm following. She just finished her PhD dissertation um, named Elise Hopman, and she's doing really important research on um, how production improves comprehension. So production practice, practicing speaking and writing improves comprehension um, when you're reading and listening. Um, so again, empirical data on this, they've, they've run studies testing it. Um, but she lists just the, some of the reasons she, she thinks this is the case. So number one, production demands more attention and higher attention uh, correlates with better learning, not just in language, but across any kind of learning. Um, another big reason is what's called the testing of retrieve information from your brain rather than just uh, recognizing it, recognizing something. So that increases fluency because fluency is all about how well you can retrieve information from your long-term memory. So all that to say, um, there are there's compelling research showing not only that speaking helps you learn a language generally, but specifically that speaking a language makes you a better reader of of, of that language. Yeah, that's <clears throat> that's really interesting and really helpful. When I when I first I came to spoken language kind of through the, through the spoken ancient languages kind of through the back door. So I started doing a lot of composition exercises with my students, and then after a while, it's like you know it just takes so long to write anything, and, but it's so it's so useful, right? Because they get to use it, they're practicing their memory, um, and it's a, good, it's, it's a good gauge for me to see what they understand and what they don't understand. And so then we can do further exercises based on that. But then it's like, it just takes so long. Despite all the benefits, it just takes so long. And I was like, well, I have an idea. Why don't we just speak it? We're just gonna be able to produce way more sentences. So uh, on top of all, of all of the benefits that have been listed, you get to hear certain terms way more, way more if you're speaking it. For instance, Familia Romana, which is uh, some folks have mentioned it in the, in the chat, which is a great text. Um, even that text can be supplemented by, in fact, it's designed to be supplemented by spoken exercises where um, where you get to hear the terms many, many more times. And also grammar, uh, also um, sentence, particular sentence, sentence styles, structures. <clears throat> you just get to see way more of the language. So that's um, the more the merrier when you're trying to, to learn a language where there's just not enough content. Um, You know, so, oh, yeah. sorry, I was, I was going to say theory, I was looking for the mute button, yeah. <laughs> the unmute button rather. Um, theory aside, I think if I were to give advice to someone who's coming to a language for the first time, I would say you could do much, much worse than to construct your, your ideal study plan around just spending as much time in the language as possible. So consuming content, producing, whatever, whatever, just whatever you do, optimize for that number of hours. And um, basically, you'll hit every single theory. <laughs> you'll, you'll check all the boxes that way. And uh, you'll have a good time doing it as well. Um, so I think that, you know, we can get, we can get sometimes, um, you know, this one hypothesis versus another hypothesis, but they all do kind of converge on most of the same thing, uh, which is why it's very hard to find, you know, to knock one out of the running or to find a crucial experiment uh, between them, um, because a lot of them are pointing in, in a lot of the same directions. There are differences in emphasis, uh, to be sure. Some, some, there are some theories that do differ a bit more, but mainstream theories, um, mainly all point in the same direction. And so if you're just spending a ton of time in the language, you're reading, you're speaking, you're, you're listening, uh, and you're writing, you could do a lot worse. In fact, I think basically anything else that you do would be worse. <laughs> Great. Well, to kind of move us forward a little bit now, imagine somebody else. This is a different. This would have to be a different character uh, in our in our cast. Uh, somebody is interested in translating 
And it's like, okay, I see what you're saying. This all sounds really great. But I just want to be a really good translator. So maybe maybe the grammar translation method is for me because that's what I want to do. What what are your thoughts for this? Uh, for it's this got translation in the title. It has to be right, right? <laughs> well, I mean, I would I would put to this person a question: Who do we get to translate modern languages? People who speak them? Yes. <laughs> so that's that's the great solid foundation for doing translation. Um, yeah, I think that don't 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 be fooled by the branding. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think this is a, an excellent question. Um, before I say more, I just want to check, am I still coming through clearly? Because I, I don't know if my internet's starting to lag a little bit. Can you all still hear me okay? Yeah, we can, we can, we can still hear good. you. Okay. You have not great. been hijacked yeah, yet. Uh, <laughs> good. Yeah, I think, um, I think it's a great question because I, I actually think the grammar translation method, that label is not great because I think it oversimplifies what translation really means because when you're translating from one language to another like professionally it, it requires mastery of both languages <laughs> it, it requires um, considering all not just one way to translate the one language into the other but the best way so you have to consider all the possibilities and and have some rationale for why you're choosing the one that you choose. What ends up happening with the grammar translation method usually, and it's because like you just can't become a an advanced level translator in the time allotted to you, is that it's really what you might call glossing rather than translating. So whenever you learn a new word or grammatical construction, you're given kind of a, hey, it's kind of like this in English. And maybe you're given two or three of those options. Like this word might mean mm -hmm. these three English <clears throat> words. But you're not getting to any advanced level where you can r give a very good rationale for choosing one or, over the other. So um, in that sense, if you want to become a translator, um, I think the grammar translation method is not the route you want to take. I think really getting a, a degree in linguistics and and going that route is probably better. But um, yeah, really just fundamentally, like we even need to define what, what we mean by translation there. And I, I just don't think the translation and grammar translation is the same as the translation and in, in the situation you described. Um, the, yeah, yeah, I mean, there's a lot more I could say, I'll, I'll just say briefly that I think that, and, and really Colin brought this up is that, um, being fluent in the language is a great foundation for for then translating that language and there's a lot lot of reasons for that um but i think most fundamentally is it allows you to engage whatever text you're translating as a discourse or a connected unit like you're not piecing it up into each word but you're seeing it as a whole um which allows you to see the meaning as a whole which allows you to consider how to transfer that meaning into another language as a whole um so yeah 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 that's a that's a really great observation i think from from now from henceforth it shall be called the glossing translation method <laughs> well sorry the glossing and grammar method two g's now uh, but what if i want to study yeah. grammar what what then <laughs> you still got grammar there <laughs> the thing is and nick brought this up you know you, if you can mix right you're allowed to to do Familia Romana and then, you know, in the evening go to uh, Wheelock. No one's going to stop you. It's not illegal, right? If you really want to know about the traditional uh, grammatical terminology, if that's the kind of thing that you're into, and hey, I get it, right? I'm a linguist. Um, <laughs> I'm into that too. Um, you're still totally able to do it, but you'll be doing it from a position of, of, of great strength. And you'll be doing it with this amazing foundation behind you. So you can sit down and say, oh, yeah, that's what they mean when they say the dative of reference. That's what they mean. That that's Oh, that's the third conjugation. Okay, great. Um, it's it's a lot harder to, to start there, as it turns out. Yeah. <clears throat> if you, if you want to do translation... You should get really good at both languages, like like Nick said. So that that means doing a lot of work with English. I, I remember I was once one of my students was doing a dissertation on John Calvin and, and the Sabbath, 
And so we read everything that Calvin had to say about the Sabbath and his institutes and his biblical commentary. And it was a lot. It was quite a bit. Um, and, and we would we would also once in a while look at um, translations. And these are these are all these are, you know, I think some of them different dates, but some of them were from the late 1800s. And there were points where I thought to myself, man, this is a terrible translation. This is this is awful. And then I would I would kind of you know, get into the time machine and realize, wait, actually, that's not a bad translation. We just don't really use those terms of phrases anymore. We would never say that today, but it made perfect sense to say it back then. And um, this is why we will always need folks who ne who really know the ancient languages. It's not because ancient Greek is going to change or biblical Hebrew is going to change or Latin is going to change. Those, those will stay um, as they are. It's the English is probably going to change. Uh, and so how we communicate these ancient languages to um, to others in terms of translation, um, the, there will always be um, room for that. Maybe not not every year, right? But um, as, as time goes by. So another uh, translation kind of re related question. So say, okay, that makes sense. But why can't I just use software that just glosses it all for me, tells me all of the meanings of the words, and then I can translate? There's software that will just I, uh, give me all this, this grammar knowledge, um, and then I can just focus on rendering it into good English. What, what do you say to this person? Um, there's a essay by a guy named Elliot Vine, Weinberger, I think is his name, uh, who's a famous trans, translator, um, where he talked about an experiment they did, um, kind of at this average, I think it was like this average middle school in New York, where <laughs> they gave the kids um, a dictionary of French and English, right? And they said, go ahead and translate this French poem into English. And these kids had never done French in their lives. They just had a dictionary. And they came up with like, okay, it wasn't like fantastic, but it, like it, it did the job. And um, his, his point though, was not that that's how you should do translation. He said that um, just glossing words is not actually translation. That's kind of the first step, but real translation begins after that. Um, and there's a... Another book that I would recommend too, uh, just in regards to translation, which maybe some of you have read, um, it's called "Is That a Fish in Your Ear?" Translation: The Meaning of Everything, <laughs> by David Bellos, who's another translator as well. Um, it'll change your life. <laughs> it, it 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 really does um, do a fantastic job at getting at what exactly is translation. Um, but yeah, so those those are just some things that I would think that like, and. In, in the book too, he talks about how glossing words, right, isn't actually going to get you very far. Um, and you start to realize this, and sometimes I'll have students do this in class where it's like you have a convoluted Greek sentence or, English, or Latin sentence. I'm like, okay, give me like a, a literal translation of this. And then it's like meaningless, right? <laughs> it like doesn't mean anything. And so translating into English actually requires a, a lot more uh, than, than just glossing words. And the farther away you get, you start going into the world of biblical Hebrew, right? And if you do, if you do a literal translation, you, you would look like a lunatic. You know, it, it just wouldn't make any sense. Um, so that's what I would say there. <laughs> I would actually recommend someone who says that to try it. Actually, just try it. I think it'll be really interesting um, because you actually, as you do that, you realize why it, it, it has its limitations. And yeah, ironically, absolutely. if you do it for long enough, you'll probably start to be getting to a point where you're starting to acquire the language because you have something like comprehensible input in front of you. You have the text and then you have a gloss, which is giving, letting you, you know, not stray too far from it. And yeah, it may end up working out for you. If, uh, if you have that at your disposal and that's 
what you have, I'd say go for it. Um, but I think as a replacement, it's not probably going to serve very well for the reasons that Carter just mentioned. Yeah, I think any thinking about translation or using digital resources, or maybe not digital, but kind of Greek or Latin or Hebrew to English or your native language resources. Um, fun, the, like one fundamental principle is just the idea that <clears throat> there is not a one-to-one -one correspondence between, sorry, any two languages. So um, there, there's no, when, when, you, when people say the Greek word literally means this and give an English word, that, that's misleading because there is always some difference between those two words and their meaning and their range of meaning and how they're used. So there's never a one-to-one -one correspondence or an exact um, equality between the two. And so that, that principle um, kind of shows why those sorts of ways of approaching the languages aren't um, adequate. When we're learning the languages, the goal is to get as close to the meaning that the author was trying to convey as possible. And anytime you introduce some other language as, as an intermediate step, um, that's just one step further away from that, um, uh, that meaning. Um, and specifically, I mean, more than that, it's that the glosses and translations that are in that dictionary or concordance or whatever you're using, someone came up with those, right? That someone they're all made said, up. <laughs> right, they're they are made up. Someone said, this is the best English word for this Greek word, or this is the best English word for this Latin word, or this is the best way to um, translate this grammatical construction from Latin to English. Like someone is coming up with that and, and they might be trustworthy. They might be reliable, but at the end of the day, um, the only way to get a more direct encounter with that meaning is to learn the language yourself, um, specifically through as much exposure to those native, um, speaker input, like, texts and things like that as possible because that's going to shape you're going to start seeing all the all the different ways that a particular word was used not all the different ways it translated in english but all the different ways that it's used all the different contexts in which it was used and that's going to give you more direct access to that meaning great great well now to move just a little bit away from translation <clears throat> to go back to grammar so say that you see this debate on um, like you know on this this Facebook debate, there's another sub thread and somebody says something like, oh, you should really like first, you should really learn the grammar. And then you see, you see these two opposing sides, strong proponents of learning the grammar. And then folks are basically are like, no, no need, no need to learn the grammar. Forget about grammar. Grammar is, is the enemy. Um, what, what is, what do you think about explicit grammar instruction is there any good there is it all bad um what are your thoughts it kind of depends on what we mean by grammar you know grammar is no no good get rid of the grammar you need grammar you're gonna get grammar um you know grammar is the it, it's that aspect of the language that that uh, has to do with how things are combined in order to to establish these four meaning correspondences. So just by putting two words together, you have grammar. So you can't escape grammar. <laughs> Open grammar is upon us whether we risk it or not. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, but probably what people mean is, you know, charts, lists of case uses, case uses, declensions, conjugations, things like that. Um, and these things are not false. These are real generalizations about the language. Um, so learning them is probably not going to hurt you. The question though, this comes down to an area where the theories do actually differ. Is there a pathway for that explicit learning, which results in explicit knowledge to swap sides and turn into the implicit knowledge that lets you do the good stuff um, of language? One kind of argument against that is that the rules of grammar as described in um, pedagogical material like textbooks are actually not the rules that seem to be active in our minds. The, the rules that are active in our minds are much more um, are much more abstract. 
and uh, and and not at all accessible to um, to reflection. Uh, now it is true that you know this ending of this noun in this case in this number is e or whatever. But um, but the grammar that that is getting built up that's just a relatively small portion of it. That's like one tag on one set of uh, grammatical features. The grammar as a whole, the actual the actual um, you know, complicated stuff that is of a different kind. And that seems to just build itself up as you go. Um, so whether the explicit teaching of verb charts and things can help you, it maybe it can. I, some theories think it, it can, some theories think it can't. It's probably not going to hurt you unless you really hate it and you avoid doing it. You avoid the whole language because you're doing it and you never want to see it again. I think that's a good argument for not doing it. But um, I think the real question comes down to, how much time do you really have to be spending on this language? And is the, this the best use of your time? Is the best use of your time to be pouring over verb charts? I doubt it. Maybe it is. Could it, in theory, help? Maybe. People say yes. People say no. Um, I think go go with the uh, go with the stuff that everyone says yes about, uh, because it also seems to work. Another thing too, um, just kind of bouncing. I mean, saying a similar thing, but basically. It can be helpful, right? Um, it's not like, like you said, Colin. It's it's not necessarily going to hurt you, unless it's going to make you scared and never turn back. Um, <laughs> but the sometimes you have students, for example, who like are going through something and they keep making mistakes about I don't know a certain um, use of the data or whatever, and. Sometimes it's just helpful to be like, hey, there's this rule that says this, this, and this. And like, oh, got it. And then they never make a mistake again. And so, you know, points like that where you can just be like, okay, this, this will help you. Um, and sometimes, you know, we talk about the natural method and just input, right? This is where, yeah, it's like, okay, maybe we can, maybe we can learn a language like a child, but we don't have to. <laughs> you know, nobody wants to spend you know three years of their life necessarily doing that. So grammar can be helpful in speeding things up because you can be like, okay, here's here, here's where that mistake, you know, can be fixed and it's just really easy. And then, you know, they're on their way. So. Yeah. Yeah. I think some good points there. I, I would, <clears throat> I think a good place to start is that explicit grammar um, probably isn't necessary to acquire a language, but it might be helpful. So that that's where I like what you said, Colin, where it's like, you might as well just go with what everyone's agreeing on because you know that's going to work. Um, and then you can kind of figure out if you think explicit grammar is going to help. But it, it seems pretty obvious that it's not necessary because people just learn languages all the time, usually first languages, but even second languages, people learn all the time without explicit grammar teaching or learning in the sense of especially like the meta language I talked about having language to talk about the language I, I do think if, if you've learned anything about me it's probably that I like distinctions um so some some more distinctions you're, I think yeah you're, you're a natural scholastic <laughs> I think um <laughs> yeah I think um it's important to kind of distinguish between explicit grammar teaching and using your native language because there are ways of doing explicit grammar teaching that don't use the native language, but you you teach the grammar in the target language. So you use Greek to explain Greek grammar. Um, just an important thing because people tend to lump those together. And there might be things that using your native language introduce that are unhelpful that just giving meta language in the target language maybe doesn't introduce. So that's important. But also there there's a, a important concept called like form focused um learning or teaching so it's in contrast to what i said about meaning focus it's where you're you are consciously focusing on the form of the language but again it doesn't necessarily involve meta language it doesn't necessarily involve um your uh, native language so i'll give an example if if i'm teaching someone english and they say yesterday i go to the store i i could say um, yesterday you go to the store or yesterday you went to the store. So that's form focused. I'm, I'm kind of drawing their attention to the form of the language. Um, and in doing so, they're not, they're, they're, like I said, cognitive capacities are being divided between meaning and form there. So in, in a sense, it's no longer meaning focused, it's form focused. 
but does that count as explicit grammar teaching? I, I don't know. Um, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. So just some distinctions there. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think there are kind of reasons to believe that actually all of those things I just mentioned, form focused, um, teaching or learning, explicit grammar instruction in the sense of giving meta language for the language and using your native language to explain things um, are all useful in certain proportions and contexts. Yeah, I but think, they're still important to distinguish. <laughs> <laughs> right. I think the, the the point about proportion is helpful. So I, I find explicit grammar instruction not in the target language. I think it can be done in a target language, but in the in you know your first language can be really helpful. So the uh, some of the materials that we work with, <clears throat> Orberg doesn't do it in the um, first language, but uh, some of the materials that we work with follow that same pattern, which is first you start with exposure to the language, right? So for instance, if you know Roman's language, you can pick up Familia Romana and read the first chapter and understand it. So you begin with exposure to the language and then you move on to certain principles. So for instance, in the Latin Primer, which is a program that Pictodicta has developed, one of the first things that students learn is in plus the ablative. It doesn't tell them that, right? So they learn a bunch of words and then it's like crazy stuff like, what else? Ubi est miles, miles est in poculo, right? In libro, and then it's, it's on top of a book, in libro, right? And then it, it goes on and on, and they see a bunch of examples. And again, notice that this is probably not natural method because it's not spontaneous communication, it's directed, uh, some natural you know, ad advocates would probably be, oh, this is too rigid or something like that. Um, but they are being trained. They're being taught to recognize a particular pattern. So I really like, Colin, what you've been saying about language being a marriage between form and meaning. So here they're, um, they're seeing, right, form within a particular context where there's meaning but there's no explicit instruction yet. They get to see a bunch of examples, a bunch of examples, a bunch of examples. And then with this method, I've seen students that can say out loud sentences that they have never seen before, which is pretty amazing. And uh, these are middle schoolers, <laughs> middle schoolers just speaking out things that they have never read or heard um, because they have, because they recognize the patterns. That's it. I mean, that's like the canonical evidence for there being some grammar that right. they've acquired. They're producing things that they've never, they've never, uh, they're producing output that they've never had input for. Yep. Um, so the principles are at work there. Um, I think it's really interesting to, to piggyback off of something Nick said about form focused instruction. So fo form focused or fo focus on form, um, uh, instruction is not just someone going up to the blackboard and saying, by the way, the third person plural of this conjugation is whatever. It also includes things like the start of Familia Romana. Familia Romana has is composed of texts uh, that draw your attention to certain grammatical features. Hmm. In plus the ablative, in plus the ablative. They don't say in plus the ablative, but you see it over and over again. That's also focus on form. Um, what Nick mentioned, uh, uh, recasts, um, you know, he, he goed home. No, no, no. He went, you mean he went home? Oh yeah. He went home. Uh, comprehension checks. These are, this is another example of focus on form because you're drawing attention to some aspect of, of, of where the, com the communication is broken down because of form. So we do this in our first languages, by the way, you know, you're telling a story. Yeah. So he, he came up to me and said, wait, he, who, who's he, right? Something is broken down there, and we do a comprehension check. We're focusing on form there too, so um, so this can be quite broad. So when we get, talk about explicit grammar, uh, grammar teaching, it's not always this this notion of someone in tweed, you know, screaming gender number case, gender number case. That actually happened to me. Um, 
I wasn't the one in tweet at the time, but um, anyway. Uh, so, so yeah, <laughs> I have some trauma, some some high school <laughs> Latin trauma <laughs> about that. Um, but uh, the it's interesting because when we look at the research on things like focus on form, uh, there are there's definitely lots of evidence that um, it does produce improvements. But one thing that this sort of applies to a lot of second language acquisition research is the way that the studies are conducted are necessarily limited. So when we're talking about uh, ourselves learning a language, we are interested in a lifetime of use of this language. Um, long term for an SLA study is not a lifetime, right? For practical reasons, it's a semester or you know, it's a couple months. So this is what you often see in terms of people talking about long-term results. You know, maybe a year, right? Because you're, these things are being done generally on undergraduate students in universities. Um, so there sometimes are practical limitations. Pardon me. I said, and sometimes to them, but anyway. And sometimes to them, <laughs> um, and also uh, the way that the studies are are, are operationalized, it's um, you're usually testing explicit knowledge. Not all of the time, but the vast majority of the time you are. And so if you have a view that sees explicit knowledge as irrelevant or superfluous or unrelated right. to implicit knowledge, it's very hard to know how to interpret these things. So this is where some of the, the confusion comes in. When you'll see someone says, a study said this, a study said that. It's it's too much to expect for for language learners to go in and look at how the studies were designed. This is why I think it's good, and this is what Nick said to go back to back to the basics, back to the way, places where where we all where we where the field all agrees, more or less. And it's yeah. to do these, these good things that have, it's you know it's like it's like when someone says how do I how can I be healthy? Well, you know you can do worse than going out and exercise. Oh, but what kind of exercise should I be doing it three times a week or four times a week? Should it be twenty or thirty minutes? You know, exercise, right? Maybe. <laughs> That. And this is a situation that we're in with with um, with giving recommendations yeah. for language learners. No, that's yeah. great. And you know, we could uh, we could you know, continue chatting about these topics, but I do want to get to some questions from the audience. So I'm just gonna uh, and we have you know I don't know if all of you have harsh limits on your time. Um, so if you if you need to go once we hit two p.m. or ten minutes from now. Uh, feel free to do so, uh, but let's let's look at some questions. So I think you'll be able to see this. This is a question by one of the listeners and a student at the Ancient Language Institute. She asks, "I have a hard time not doing grammar translation, even when I don't mean to. I feel like it's the only way I can be sure why the grammar is what it is. How to really just read without doing that? Thoughts on how to move beyond?" Um, translating in your head. One good way is to crank down the difficulty of the text. When you crank down the difficulty of the text and you are at a, a comprehension, um, where you're at a comprehension level where you're just sailing through, you don't have time to to stop and, and smell the grammatical roses. You're just you're just going. You're just reading like you would read in your first language, and so that would be one recommendation for that. That I've actually in my own private private uh, uh, experience of, of um, doing the same thing because I'm the kind of guy who likes to, to get distracted by grammar and like, hey, what's, and what's the etymology and, you know, but I don't do that when I'm, when I'm uh, reading something that I have a uh, really high comprehension of. Yeah. Um, you said one way. I, I would say that is the way, the, the primary way. And it's a, a big mistake I think people make when it comes to languages is they think to progress, they need to progressively deal with harder and harder texts, but most people, what they need is, is to dial it back and deal with easier texts. And so um, <clears throat> one, like I mentioned way back in the beginning is that there's kind of a minimum threshold um, of what you need to know in a text in order to be able to um, read it fluently or to stay meaning focused. And a, a lot of scholars in the field say that that number is 98 percent. So you, have, you need to know 98% or more of what's in a text to be able to stay focused on the meaning, um, which especially when it comes with these ancient languages, um, when it comes to these ancient languages, it, at, when you're at the beginner, or even intermediate level, there, there are very few, if any, texts at that level. 
Um, and that's why you need some resources, whether it's someone who can speak the language proficiently to create that input for you, um, or a program like Biblingo that we have produced um, materials like that. Um, but that that's what you need. And um, to kind of um, I, I'm like obsessed with what co cognitive psychology brings to the table right now. And I, I was reading some studies and basically they said that um, it's very co common for people when they're reading a language, uh, I mean, reading a text in a second language to um, you, you use mental translation into their tar their primary uh, native language uh, during the, the process. But um it happens when to go back to the idea of cognitive capacity it happens when you're exceeding the the capacity that you have cognitively so when thinking about it in the target language becomes too much effort for you you switch into your native language because it's easier and so that's why it's so important to go to really 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 easy texts so that you never hit that capacity level that causes you to switch and, and that's what they say is um in these studies that uh, as your reading proficiency grows, which has to do not only with your fluency, but the complexity of language that you're able to process, um, the less you use mental translation as an aid. Now, it's it's not necessarily a bad thing to use mental translation. Again, it's kind of inevitable when you hit that capacity level. Um, but if you want to practice not doing that, what you need to do is go to easier texts so that you never reach that that cognitive right. capacity. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. And I think on top of on top of that, I think it, it's also a matter of habits. So some the you know, I think we've all encountered people who are just so used to translating when learning a language, and that's become a habit. And so sometimes you need to break that habit. <laughs> and how do you do that? Um, one thing that I have found um, really effective is that is using audio. Especially because with Latin, with Latin you have so many resources. So there's great audio for Familia Romana. So if you haven't listened to the audio of, say, chapter one, start with that. Start just listening without looking at the text. Um, one advantage that listening has to reading in this case is that when you're reading, you have the luxury of, of just stopping. You don't have that luxury when you're just listening. And this is also why uh, what Nick was saying, having someone right there in front of you speaking to you and with you and at you <laughs> in the target language is so useful because you're just listening to it. There's nothing there that's not attached to anywhere where you can just pause. You just have to process it. And either you do or you don't. And if it's, and if it's at um, a level of ease where you can just you know, take it in, that's, I think that that's going to be really successful. Um, in terms of breaking that that habit and and moving beyond uh, translation. Just a very quick thing about breaking the habit. You can also go and try a different language. So your experience with that can bring out what is kind of essential to the process of, of uh, language acquisition rather than what is specific to that language that you've been studying. So it's often nice to take a break, you know, now knowing what you now know, go and try another language and, and see if you can establish some good habits there that you can bring back to what you were looking at before. Yeah, yeah. that's great. Um, I'm going to move on to the next question. We could probably have a whole uh, you know, roundtable discussion on that question. I think it's a great question, um, but uh, we're going to have to move on <laughs> uh, to this next question. So uh, Bruce, he says, what's the current consensus and acquisition theory on different styles of learning? Uh, examples, listening and demonstrations versus seeing the printed word, for example. So learning styles, what, what do you think? I'll confess that I, I'm not extremely well versed on the literature on learning styles. My, um, my gut reaction is that they're not extremely in favor at the moment um, in the literature. Um, but I think there is some research about uh, having to do with getting getting the input in, um, say, through reading versus through listening versus through both at the same time. There can be some benefits of getting both at the same time. There can also be some drawbacks of getting both at the same time. So, uh, you know, you have to sort of experiment and see what works for you. 
Um, but I'm not, I'm not uh, too aware of any literature showing like a lot of individual differences in, in how that works, but I could be wrong because that's not something I've delved into extensively. Yeah, similar. Um, I haven't come across too much research that deals with that specifically. Perhaps that is says something about it that that it isn't um, a big topic of conversation in the field right now. I do know that kind of a more recent development in the field is toward what people call like socio-cultural methods, I think, um, that do deal more with... Um, just the varied contexts and reasons and things like that people would be learning languages, but it has more to do with like, you know, are you, are you learning a language to be able to communicate in a different culture? And are you in that culture? And what are your motivations and stuff? It's not so much learning styles in the sense of, are you a visual learner? Are you a auditory learner or whatever else? I, I do think that those are less, um, less prominent in terms of the the conversation and and besides that it's just again when when these these this research is putting forward certain things they're not making those distinctions like okay input is is essential for these particular types of people it's like no like in general input is is essential you know so um it doesn't seem to be super important in terms of what people are talking about yeah, in terms of, um, so yeah, I have zero familiarity with the research on this area, but in terms of learning styles, I, uh, I, you've, there's been a few things coming out that say, yeah, it's it's overhyped, right? It's like, I only learn if I do X. Probably not true. But it is really helpful to, to interact with the language using as many senses as possible. So with uh, Pictodicta materials, right? You see a sword, you just see the sword and you don't have a translation that says sword, gladius. It's just gladius, right? And, and so you see it and you hear it, right? And you get to hear it and you can click on it as many times as you like. Uh, Biblengo uses a similar method, if not the same one for introducing vocabulary where you see it and you hear it and you read it, right? So you're... Um, if you can find a way to interact with the language using as many senses as possible, that's going to um, make it more memorable for you. Um, so I don't know about research, but I've seen it really work with my students. And it's also just more fun if you can see it and hear it um, and taste it. But, you know, you can't really taste swords too often. <laughs> I mean, not to live to tell the tale. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, I think um, I think there is second language acquisition research research that supports that. For example, um, just a simple principle. Paul Nation, you know, one of our favorites, um, says that one of the most important conditions for learning is uh, he says varied meetings and varied use, which just means that you're reading, listening, speaking, and writing the language in varied ways. Um, like you're seeing vocabulary words in varied context mm -hmm. and varied yeah. forms using its whole range of meaning and things like that. But um, behind that, um, a again, cognitive psychologist, I think her name is Joanna Christodoulou, which those who are studying Greek might know what that means. Um, she she basically simplifies it and just says the more connections you have, you've made to a particular word or construction basically like the more routes you have to get to it in your mind. So if you have connected that word with not only an English gloss, but you've connected it with a sound and you've connected it with an image and you've connected it with all these things, you have like more inroads to retrieve it from your long-term memory. Um, and again, there's like a cognitive basis for that. Um, so I think that is definitely supported in the research very strongly. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, Last question, last question, and then we can all go eat tacos. Um, so Tim Avery says, if what you ultimately want to develop is specifically the skill of reading, to what extent should one center communicative activities around written texts? What are different ways this could look? So if we look at reading, um from this sort of skill-based perspective that uh, I was mentioning earlier, it has as a prerequisite your 
developmental representation of the language, your knowledge of the language, how the language works, uh, the, the, the sense that allows you to produce and comprehend. And then once that's there, then you can start developing the, um, the fluency uh, or speed, automaticity of reading. Um, however, there's a bit of a chicken and egg thing, right? Because um, how are you going to get that input? Maybe, you know, through reading. And so the, you get a, into a, a, virtuous, um, <laughs> a, a virtuous circle. But uh, I think that get the input however, however is easiest to get yourself up to the, you know, a point where you can start to read texts that you want to read. And then, um, and then just, you could then orient yourself to war more towards reading if you're not interested at all in speaking, but you have a really nicely, um, a nicely developed mental representation of the language, which, um, which looks like, you know, you don't forget it when you're tired, that kind of thing, right? We don't forget to say, um, you know, he likes her. We don't accidentally say she when we're tired as native speakers of English. That's just sort of, that's our, our knowledge of English. It doesn't depend on that. Uh, so once you have that, that really developed representation, then you can just focus on um, focus on fluency building activities. Of course, you'll be probably at the point where you don't need to listen to advice from me. Uh, if you're at that at that point, you're just off doing what you want. Yeah, I would agree. I think I mean, we've already kind of talked about this, but like assuming your goal is not to speak the language, especially with Latin, you, know, you get all sorts of people who don't really care about speaking it, but I still always bring them in being like, okay, we're going to speak Latin. <laughs> it's going to be uncomfortable at first, but it'll get better. Um, but even if your goal isn't to speak it, we're still going to use speaking as a method because like, of, like what's already been said, it's a really good way of kind of internalizing, you know, structures that um, it would be really hard to do if you just read it. And so even when, um, if, I mean, just kind of talking about that question in particular, if you are really wanting to just read Latin, I would still recommend um, reading out loud as you're going through. Um, and even if you're with a teacher, um, a really good way to use speaking to help improve your reading is ask questions about the text in the language. Um, and those are all good ways to kind of again, fossilize and kind of um, really get your uh, mastery of it up because then you can go back and just read it through and you'll be able to comprehend it so much better than you could before. And that's how it is in personal experience too. So. Oh, uh, Nick, final, final words here. Oh, wonderful. Um, yeah. I would say, you, you should center your communicative activities around written texts um, quite a lot in, in different ways. So one is like from a, you might call it a syllabus standpoint, which what I mean by that is just like, what vocabulary and grammar are you prioritizing? And I think you should prioritize learning the vocabulary and grammar that's going to be important for the text you want to read. So that.